So a uh, publisher came to my door one day, knocked on the door, <coughs> and said, hey, um, the company noticed that all their slides are out on YouTube. <laughs> Some of these slides that I use, right, they give to me to use in the classroom. And then you may have noticed that I then take them, put them up there, and I'm recording what I'm saying. So I was published on YouTube a mix of their content and my own content. And because you guys will participate in class, your content, right? You'll add things, questions, etc. I'm all into mixing content. Um, so they said, well, they told me that you, the only license or permission you had was to use those within the walls of the classroom. So I started down a philosophical conversation about what is the classroom? Because <laughs> I'm not a four-waller, man. If I can get out of this classroom, I'm, I, I, why do you all have to sit in rows in, in walls to learn things? You can learn things in lots of different places. So uh, anyway, I started down, and then I just stopped. I said, you know what? You know me. I know you. <coughs> Tell them if they have a problem with it, come see me. They said, he came back later and he said, they said they're fine with it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> right? I don't think it had anything to do with it. I'm on terrain. No. <laughs> so, it wasn't going to be a fight, though. Right. Well, you know, I'm... <clears throat> um, they probably figured it wasn't going to be easy. Yeah. But, you know, the f that, I think that's the funny thing is, like, well, who else in the world is going to want to look at or listen to me? I mean, you guys are forced to, more or less, right? <laughs> but who else is going to, like, right. go on YouTube looking for my slides to listen to me? Well, it turns out quite a few people. They have thousands of hits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, tens of thousands of wow. hits. Like, if you go out to the college's YouTube site, I'm one of the highest. <laughs> so... It's not you, I don't think, but it's somebody. It's me. I keep watching myself. <laughs> oh, I remember he said that. That was so good. So anyway, that's just, you know, that's a related topic, right? You know, we take some work that we're licensed to have or not to have. And um, just a little bit about me in addition to uh, teaching full time. Here, I also help other faculty learn how to use instructional technology. And so they're always coming to me saying, well, if I find it on YouTube, it's okay for me to use it, right? Well, there's not a law that says that. <laughs> well, I, it, it won't be infringing work, will it? Could be. You guys know there's tons of stuff on YouTube that's Stole. stolen or, you know, it's being used without permission. And then... To use it yourself could be a problem. So I deal with these issues a lot. What is intellectual property? You guys should have got at least that part of the chapter. It's like the first page, I think. What is it? Ideas. Ideas. No. Actual it's words. not. Something. Yes. Yeah. It's ideas that come out of your head. You cannot protect your idea itself, right? I tried that. Like, you know, that late nine commercial comes on TV and says you could patent this or that or whatever. And then another one where they come out with this really cool gadget. I'm like, I thought of that first. That's mine. You tried to sue. I know. I tried to sue them. And they're like, well, what did you do? Oh, nothing yet. But it was my idea. I thought about it a long time ago. Has anybody done that? Mm -hmm. Like coming up with a really good idea and they're like, uh, tell us, what was the idea? No, because then I'll steal it. So intellectual property starts in your head, but it's got to come out somehow to have any kind of protection. Otherwise, it's just you saying, yeah, I thought of that. So uh, when you open the book, if you have, <laughs> chapter 5 starts on what page? 126, right? Over on the left it says intellectual property. Property resulting from intellectual or creative processes. I like the definition in the, in the paragraph a little better. 
um, somewhere in there it talks about production or you know something that's actually made not just the idea right, or the, the creative thought that's in your head right? so we'll, we'll talk about the basic types of intellectual property protections uh, and then move into internet law next week I would I would say that we cover a lot of the textbook today and a lot of uh, class that started next week is, is is some from the textbooks but some other resources that, I, that I'm going to give to you because I mean, what better to talk about internet law than to get on the internet <laughs> eh? Eh? Why, why sit and listen to me lecture to you about something that's on paper about the internet right. so it's kind of a roadmap of what we're talking about today, and uh, you don't need to write that all down because you have all these slides. Plus, it's on page 126 at the start of the chapter, but it gives you an idea of where we're going. We're already talking about what intellectual property is and is not. Uh, why does the law protect trademarks and patents? Well, we'll start even more basic than that. What are they? Right? And what's the difference? People, the news, they throw around these terms all the time. Right? And so you hear somebody say, well, they had a copyright when it's not even subject to copyright protection. It would be a patent or it would be a trademark or something else. So we're going to start with the basics of what are the differences. Uh, and it says, what laws protect an author's rights and works that they produce? Multiple laws. And then things like trade secrets and, and even things that, that have value to a business, which is, this is business law. Uh, that, that maybe aren't subject to specific statutory protection. As you read the start of the chapter, in addition to statutory protection at the federal level, there's also protection at the state level and even common law protection, right? Because there wasn't always statutes, was there? Like what about that Coke case? Remember the Coke case? <laughs> Coke is bad, but dope is good. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Because I'm recording this. Hopefully someone will explain. Because then it's like, all right, we got this recording, and he's saying dope is good in class. But uh, look on page 127 in case you haven't read this case. <coughs> Decision. Yes for Coke. No for dope. Right? But don't get that backwards. Right? What were they saying in this case? They were saying it was okay for competitors to use the the word dope and right. But Why? Not, but not Coke. Right. Because dope really didn't relate to co the Coca Cola trademark. Right. Really. Yeah. It wasn't confusing. I mean, it wasn't an infringement. But Coke, yes, because you know Coke in this case is spelled a little <coughs> different. But what was the product? Cola leaves. Yeah. So uh, it was when you look in the the actual case, it talks about how. Maybe you didn't even know this, but early days of Coca-Cola, what was in it? Okay. Cocaine. Right? So the whole theory is here that, well, now it doesn't have cocaine in it, so that's deceiving. You can't call your product Coke. <laughs> so interesting battles that we'll talk about. And then finally, what steps have been taken to protect intellectual property in the digital age? We'll, we'll talk more about that um, next class. But it's safe to say uh, a lot of these laws initially didn't consider digital rights. They didn't exist. Digital rights, what are those? Right? We didn't think in terms of owning bits. We didn't have the internet. My joke can be A207 is Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about that in, in, in our class in Business Law 1 about how when they framed the Constitution and they were talking about interstate commerce, did commerce mean e-commerce? <laughs> not at all. I mean, it was not, I mean, no one could even envision the network that would be in existence today and how commerce is actually transacted. Did I tell you about my kid buying a bunch of stuff on Amazon? 
and that whole idea that you you know you can buy it anywhere anytime quickly um, I don't know how he does it I got every protection in place I can think of and the kid hacks <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, first bullet up there intellectual property or IP is any property that is a product of an individual's mind. Think a song, a book, a poem, software, music. It may be subject to different types of intellectual property protection under different laws, but really, generally, intellectual property is all about stuff that comes out of your head. A lot of stuff comes out of your head. <laughs> it's not all valuable, at least in my case. I think sometimes people get in this idea that, well, unless it's novel and unique, I don't have any rights to it. Right? You write a poem, a song, a book, it's yours. So, how far do we go back? Second bullet, U.S. Constitution protects IP in Article 1, Section 8, Congress shall. Why go back this far? Things have certainly changed since then to kind of get at the purpose of protecting intellectual property. Promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. What does that sound like to you? I mean, it sounds like a lot of fancy words, but what is that saying? Way, way back when, the constitutional framers, it's like when I was in junior high, what, why did they do this? To promote create, creativeness in people and not worry about someone stealing their art right. or their craft. Right, we want this. We want the nation to prosper and <coughs> if People don't want to say anything or do anything because as soon as it comes out, someone else snatches it. This is a problem. I'm paraphrasing the founding fathers. Probably said it a little different than that. Yeah. I have a little bit of a problem with securing it for limited times. Right. Um, if I create something, mm -hmm. if I write something, mm -hmm. why can I only have it for right. a limited time and yeah. call it mine? You know, this is a, it's a good question. This is an example of how the Constitution in so many ways was a compromise. Isn't now I could, the, yeah, go ahead. Isn't the limited time like 80 years or something? Like well, that? it yeah, depends. I like to use that answer to all your questions. <laughs> right, because right? you saw in the chapter that it, would, it depended upon what type of intellectual property you were talking about and, and what kind of statutory protection it used to have versus what it might have had when a new statute was passed, etc. So. The, the amount of time varies. But, you know, I was telling my uh, Business Law 1 class that the Constitution was a compromise between those who wanted centralized government and those who wanted power to go to the states. Same thing here. There's a bunch of folks sitting around saying, you know, I want to be able to share and profit from my ideas. I'm afraid someone's going to steal it. And then someone else said, wait a second. If it's an exclusive right to use one's writings and discoveries, I think if you think in terms of a book you write or something like that, you feel like, well, it's mine, it's unique, I should own it forever, but what if it's a patent or process of something that's of benefit to the public or society? How long do you get to hold on to that? This is a government monopoly, <coughs> right? This is a constitutional right to have a monopoly on something. Do we want that forever? So, I mean, I hear you. More people have a problem with how long it is now versus how short, but doesn't it depend on which side of the coin you're on? Mm -hmm. and like I talk to people about criminal law, you know, and I say, don't you guys really feel like the person sitting there and the defendant probably did it or why else would they be there? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you feel that way till it's you, <laughs> right? S same thing here. You create the work, you're really ticked when somebody steals it or uses it, and you want the protection. Uh, but no one can see this on the recording, so you can just raise your hands, you don't have to say anything, but how many of you have 
downloaded music that you didn't pay for, or or watched a video that you didn't pay for, or whatever. Yep, pretty much. Um, I'll now I'll start naming you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the other day, my kids wanted to watch something, right? So I'm like, well. I always use Amazon, I use whatever. I just, I just Google and see what different sources there are for this stuff. Oh my goodness. I didn't do it. <laughs> but, I mean, you can get this stuff in lots of different places. I suspect some of it is <coughs> illegally obtained or used, right? not properly licensed. So, but when you're, what I, where I was going with that is, when you're on the flip side of that and you're thinking, my goodness, I don't want to pay that much for the rights to use that for 24 hours. That's insane. I have the disc already or, or something like that. Anybody ever think that? Like, I paid for this once. Why would I have to pay for it again? Or I've given this artist enough of my money. They won't mind if I take one of their songs or whatever. So there's, there's both sides to this. And then there's a bullet at the bottom that's supposed to, I guess, speak for itself. Ownership of IP is strategically important in the global economy. This just sounds cool, doesn't it? <laughs> well, well, what, what does that mean? Again, I don't know how much the framers of the Constitution, when they wrote that statement above, were thinking about that below. <coughs> but what does that mean? We thought you'd tell us. It's on your slide. You're the one talking. Yeah. If you don't have uh, intellectual property globally, I guess, then it reduces your ability to trade because they'll mm -hmm. just take it and make right. it over there. Right. And do. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, if we only had protection of intellectual property rights within the United States, this causes a big problem because we deal globally now. Commerce is not just interstate. It's global, international commerce. So you, as you read the chapter, you, you found about uh, a laws about agreements with other countries in terms of inf enforcing intellectual property rights. It is a global economy, especially on the internet. All right, let's start with trademark. Trademark is a distinctive motto, mark, or emblem. It's stamped or affixed to a product. And the reason for it is to identify it in the market. Well, what page does it talk about, start talking about trademark? 127. All right. So very beginning of the chapter, it talks about page 127. Uh, and it goes into 128. And it starts talking on page 128 about the statutory protection that's available for trademarks. Uh, it gives uh, that example, that case on page 128 of, of formerly Sam Buck's coffee house. Right. Now Sam's Coffee, according to the picture there. So I think as we, as we start to talk about trademark, one assumption that I see people make time and time again on the quiz, on the final, in life, is that the only way you can be responsible for trademark infringement is if, if it's intentional. Now, this is not the case. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But, but it, you know, we mentioned the Coca-Cola case already. You know, the example of some emblem, motto, mark. Can you think of any other mottos, marks, emblems? Apple. Sure. Right? It's on the window of my office over there. <laughs> and if you walk by my office, you see that. But um, I came home one day, and my uh, oldest son had taken a bunch, you know, if anybody's ever bought an Apple product, they give you all these Apple stickers that you run around and advertise them <laughs> with. And he'd stuck them on all kinds of things. Like, um, I hadn't washed the truck in a little while. It was all dirty on the back window. And he just kind of smeared it off a little spot there and stuck it on there. And they, I don't know, it was one on one of his brothers or something. You know, they're, they're all over the place. So, yeah, the, just seeing the, the Apple you guys ever notice the Apple? I think so. Right. Recent cases about um, the Apple. What do, what do you see when you see, look at the Apple? A bite out of it. A bite out of it. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's satanic. 
<laughs> that's what that's what the most recent case is about. Uh, yeah, the yeah. fact that you know this has a little bite out and that's a reference to original sin, oh, oh, the fruit, gotcha, gotcha. right? I don't know. I always thought it was like a bite, like B Y T E. I don't know. I, that's what I was thinking, but hmm. maybe Steve Jobs was. <laughs> <evil>. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the Apple logo. Well. I mean, don't, don't you see some of these products? I mean, you, you know Apple. You, know, you don't see the word there, but you, I mean, you see these logos, <coughs> mottos, whatever, affixed to something. Nike swoosh, right? Mm -hmm. Flying windows. Yes. <laughs> windows. Um, McDonald's, even the arches, you know? Like, my kids, well, I, I, probably most people now don't have to see the word McDonald's to know <laughs> where McDonald's is at, right? See, like you, we talk later in the chapter, what's coming up here, real quick here, trade dress, right? Even think of colors. Like if I say, you know, red and yellow, you know, you know I'm talking about McDonald's. Or, or like what's Starbucks colors? Green, white, Green, white brown lately for some Green. reason. All right, so uh, a distinctive model marker emblem stamped or fixed to a product. Don't get that confused with um, copyright. And then, uh, like I said, on page 128, it starts talking about statutory protection. So statutory protection started with the Lanham Act of 1946. It says it provides protection of manufacturers, which is probably where you came up with that question, right? Mm -hmm. right. So um, I think what the uh, publisher means that uh, everything at some point is made, right? Didn't exist, now it does. Mm -hmm. So that's how they define manufacture. Not as in only those that engage in the manufacturing industry are protected. So from from losing business to rivals that use confusingly similar brands and products. Um, but before you just write that down and then your thoughts move on to the next topic, that's not the extent of the law today. Right? Back then, in 46, that's what the statute said. Right? So when you look on, um, right under statutory protection of trademarks it mentions the Lanham Act of 1946. And then in the next paragraph it says trademark dilution and it says before 1995. Before 1995, what, I'm sorry. Excuse me, did they spell losing the same way in 1946? They, they did, it's the English. I see. Yeah. I see. <laughs> um, did they spell it right in the chapter? Because it says the same thing. Yeah, they spell it correctly in the chapter. <laughs> so, you guys catch that L O S I N G, not L O O S I N G. Mm -hmm. um, so, confusingly similar brands and products. But then in the next paragraph it says, before 1995, federal trademark law prohibited only the unauthorized use of the same mark on a competing or an uncompeting but related good or service. Protection was given only when the unauthorized use would likely confuse consumers as to the origin of these goods and services. All right, so why am I reading this to you? Because there's a trick coming, at least you're gonna say it's a trick later. I'll have a question somewhere that'll say something about you're only titled to inf an infringement action or protection when whatever somebody does confuses the consumer. Well, that's what it used to be. Okay. Then you go on and it, reads, it says, in 1995, Congress amended the Lanham Act by passing the Federal Trademark Dilution Act. So you gotta know that one, which allowed trademark owners to bring a suit in federal court for dilution. Trademark dilution laws protect distinctive or famous trademarks, and it gives you some examples a number of them we've already mentioned. How distinctive is Dell anymore? I, don't, I guess because it's the word Dell, or the circle or something. From certain unauthorized uses, even when the use 
is on a non-competing good or is unlikely to confuse. So don't you just know me, my evil mind, I'm just gonna come out, I can come up with all kinds of questions around, around this, right? I'm gonna say true or false, you know? And then I'll say something about um, somebody can only bring in dilution action if it confuses the consumer. Well, that's not what it says. Even when the use is on non-competing goods or is unlikely to confuse. So even if somebody isn't confused, even if they said, hey, we should not be found responsible for this because we're not confusing <coughs> the consumer, that's not the point. You dilute. What's dilute mean? Break down. Or right. <laughs> when you cause the value to be reduced, whether you intend to confuse anybody or not, you can be held responsible. So it's wide open there, boy, isn't it? It it it's a lot wider than it used to be. <laughs> so here it is, Trademark Dilution Act, 1995, amended the Lanham Act to bring federal cause of, to bring a federal cause of action. These slides here in federal court for dilution. Notice the difference. Right. So it's, it's, it's saying, well, in, your, in this particular case, even though you didn't confuse the consumer, you still reduce the value of our intellectual property. Um, similar marks may give rise to dilution suits. So that means we move from using the same mark to marks that are similar, whether they confused or not. Yeah. So what if it doesn't make, like, what if it doesn't make the product value decline? What if it increases the product value? So what would be an example of that? Well, I don't know exactly, but... <laughs> No, I'm serious, I hear you. though. I hear you, and, and I, I guess that was a risk of me defining dilution as reducing the value, because that's not a, re a requirement of the statute. Like, you can claim somebody infringed on your intellectual property rights. You can claim that, you can claim that now, even if you don't have to bring forward a consumer and go put them on the stand and say, were you confused? Yes. You don't need that. And you don't need according to the statute, extensive evidence that somehow the value of your product was diluted. That comes up as an, as an argument. But the problem is you gotta stop people before they ruin you. So, I guess the point of this is, in 95, there was an attempt to move beyond just uh, an action for using the same mark where people are confused to say if there's if it's similar and there's a potential for confusion that's enough or a potential for devaluation because as you read the chapter um, you know it talks about um, strong marks <coughs> secondary meanings generic on the next few pages what happens if you're not proactive about protecting your intellectual property rights? There, there can be problems, right? You know, you flip the page and you look at, at page 130. Pretty soon your term that used to be aspirin, that used to be protected, right, becomes a generic term that everybody uses. So you don't want to wait for that, I guess is my point. All right, so similar marks may give rise to dilution suit. They don't have to be the same one. What does this mean? I mean, practically, for you. Like, some of you might be here because you are interested in or are in your own business. Right? Mm -hmm. So what does this all practically mean to you? Who cares about the land <coughs> act or what intellectual property is right now? If you 
have a good idea, you better right. bring it to fruition and then... <laughs> right, if you have a good idea, you better do something about it and get protection for it. That's part of it. But here what we're saying is, let's say you got a good idea and you come up with this cool logo, mark or emblem, what do you need to do? Trademark. You Register. No, you guys are... You gotta you, make sure it's not like somebody else's. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You, you need to protect your work, but you also need to look at, from the flip side, you need to protect yourself. Because if you come up with something completely, on, you guys get me? You could come up with it, just pull it out of the blue. I came out of my mind, I had this really cool idea for a computer. Uh, it, it turned out, I, I wanted to do a, an orange that somebody took a bite out of. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do you know there's this other company that has an apple and it looks just like it that, that probably is not that the case but you know what I'm saying you come up with some mark logo or whatever and you even if you could say golly gee I didn't intend for it uh, and it turns out that there's a competitor or somebody who makes a similar product like yours even, they don't have to establish that people were confused all they have to establish is we came up with it first and there's a potential that you're going to harm us by what you're doing. Yeah. Is it my responsibility to investigate whether or not another one is out there? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Then what is the role of the U.S. Patent and Trademark uh, in Washington? <laughs> that's a good question. To, uh, I to mean, take, I don't have to take years and years and years, years, right? So basically what they do is they manage the law and process around it um, so that if you're seeking in some cases additional protections you go through their process and and they do some checks um, and maintain a database that would permit others to you know look and see what's out there you know sometimes and sometimes that's why you say things like see things like patent pen patent pending did your statute did your book say anything about what statutory protection you have for a pending patent? <laughs> Why do you think people do that though? To keep somebody else from Right, because they want to, they want people to know as soon as possible and because it is a long process they want to say look we got a head start on you. Right, and there's a whole thing about discussion about prior art you know we came up with the idea first it was out there and now all of a sudden you come up with the idea. Um, like Starting this year, they passed a new law that, um, for prior art, it doesn't matter anymore unless you can show that they, like, it's now it's whoever patents it first. If somebody had prior art that you didn't see, and you come up with an idea and then are the first one to patent it, then you are the one who's granted the patent, not them, but if they can show that you piggybacked off their idea, then. I think I follow you, but try again. <laughs> okay. So, like, let's say that two companies come up with the same idea, one before the other. But the one that came up with it later had no idea of the other company's idea, but they were right, the ones yes. who had it first. So in, in terms of just patent law, yeah. all right, so in you've got two people law. come up with the idea. All right, now one person applies for a patent. Yeah, right. the one that was, like, let's say be before, it would have been the one who came up with it first, regardless of when they patented it. Whether they actually got the patent. Yeah. Right. And yes. now it's whoever patent like attempts to patent at first is the one who's granted protection unless the one who came up with a prior can show that they paid right the idea of yeah. uh, it's it's not a race yeah it's the one who can first show evidence that it was their idea that, first. that's what it used yes. to be they changed it now to form with more international laws u.s is the only country that had it so i'm still not sure I'm, I'm tracking let's start okay. again all right somebody comes up with an idea okay, let's say two and they apply for a patent yeah. yeah yes and let's say another company came up with the same idea before them but did not apply for the patent right away. So the company that came up with the second applied for the patent first. It used to... It just lost me again. Okay, never mind. <laughs> the newer company applied yeah. for the first company. Yeah. First and they were So somebody comes up with an idea, okay. and they don't patent. They don't no. have to seek application. They're still in development, but then another company comes up with the same idea. Oh, patent, okay. And so that's different. And patents it. All right. It used to be that the first company who came up with it, who had the prior work um, to it, um, would be the ones who would actually own the intellectual property and be able to patent it, and they would be able to get the other company's patent thrown out. But now it's whoever patents it first, not who comes up with it first. So let me give you an example. Let me give you an example to see if, if we're saying the same thing here. 
somebody comes up with an idea, comes out of their head, it's a process <coughs> of some kind, mm. and they don't seek a patent initially for yeah. it. That's what you're saying. Uh, it, it, but they do have evidence that they came were up developing and came up with the yeah. idea first. Now along comes someone else afterwards who comes up on their own, comes up with the idea, and then immediately seeks patent protection. Yeah. You're saying that um, if a person can establish that they actually did something with the idea first, they have priority over somebody who applies so that's for That's what it used to be like before this year. Saying. That's the old system. Now they implemented the new system this year that completely changes that. To? To whoever um, goes to patent first. The one who, the date of the application of the patent or the date, the date of, of the, the patent? The application of the patent. What statute is that? It's, I have no idea what statute it is. It was just passed this year and began to take effect. Um, see what you can find on okay. that. So but that's can, an intellectual property. Right. Right. So he was, so I what, asked him about that. You know what? I, I don't doubt that yeah. at all. Um, it's I a think, really confusing system. Right. But I think what would be helpful is an example of how that might work, perhaps a case or okay. whatever. So, um, at least in terms of what we're talking about here, the idea is to show evidence that you came up with the idea and sought mm -hmm. patent protection. Because when you look at the chapter, and it talks on the, we're kind of jumping ahead to talk about patents here. 135. Um, Yeah, patents actually starts on page 135, and it talks about the uh, the idea of granting a patent and then um, the patent database, which is what got our discussion talked about. What good is this process? You know, keeping a record of, of intellectual property protection, and then it talks about um, the remedies for patent infringement. Right? So yeah, let's. Let's find a case or an example of that today so we can see exactly what you're talking about. Okay. All right, so um, back to trademark dilution. So in 95, the law changed, and currently, this is far as I know. Oh, I know something else I was going to say about that. Intellectual property attorneys have additional training. Yeah, they have to the pass the second bar exam. Right. So somebody who practices in that area, it's, it's a good thing because the law does change frequently. Because even though there's it's statutory law in terms of processes, there's also case law that comes along that can affect that. I know that seems kind of hard because it seems as if, OK, here's the law. It's in black and white. What would possibly change that? What changes is how the court interprets or applies that in a case. Uh, plus, everybody seems to hate the patent and trademark office. Yeah. So if the book says one thing and the law has changed since the book has come out and well, it came out. This is this is why I want some clarity on what he's saying and show you an example of it because I think I know what he's talking about, but I'd like to see the case or example. I'm not saying that the book conflicts with what he's saying right now. Well right. What he's saying is that another, a new law or statute or limitation came out, and I totally get that. Right. But in a case where, like, it was confirmed that this did happen, would we be tested on the current law or the law in the book? Um, well, since I've already written it, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that I'm not going to test you on what we're talking about right now. Yeah. But, it is about learning, too, so I'd like to know what case or statute he's talking about so we can apply it to this and you can see. But no, don't envision me coming into class next time and you find the case? Well, I found it on CNN. They didn't oh. specifically talk about a case. It's just a change in law. Yeah. But the way they, they it's what he said, they, the way they word is the new law takes us from first to invent to first to file. Yeah. Not, not actual granting of the patent protection, but the first date of application for the patent? Protection is granted once you file. Patents are awarded to the entity that files first. 
So it and what, what, it statute, what statute is it? Or does it uh, say? CNN is always CNN, good probably. about saying what the law is that they're talking about. I'm betting somebody before the class is over will find the statute that we're talking about. But don't get too distracted right. by that. All right, so yes, proof of what I was saying earlier. You know, we're in a different age and the law changes frequently. All right, so uh, this is a little bit about what we're talking about. Notice it says patent and trademark office. So we were talking about patents. In this case, we're talking about trademarks. Um, trademark registration, U U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, there's a link to it, gives notice to third parties. So when you look at, um, where is it at? Trademark registration, look at the bottom of page 128. Trademarks may be registered with the state or with the federal government. Unless the laws change in that. I, think it has. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't think, it was think just it has. mainly for patents. Right. Yeah, I, I think so too. But um, to register for protection under federal trademark law, a person must file an application with the U.S. Brent and Trademark Office. Uh, a mark can be registered if, one, it's currently in commerce, or two, if the applicant intends to put the mark into commerce within six months. Notice that on top next page that that's extended. Notice that it can be extended, um, and then depending upon the year that um, it was registered, it might be for a longer period of time. But notice there's um, there's a difference on the top page 129 between application and registration. See that? So it says, in special circumstances, the six-month period can be extended by 30 months, giving the applicant a total of three years from a date of notice of trademark approval to make use of the mark and file the required use. Registration is postponed until the mark is actually used. Hmm. There's a little distinction there between application for protection and registration. Why? Because it's possible somebody might want to get protection for their idea but not actually put the mark into commerce. All right. Trademark infringement. So when I use the word infringement, we'll use it for patent, we'll use it for trademark, we'll use it for copyright. Infringement has to do with an allegation that somebody interfered with your intellectual property rights. Again, not necessarily that it devalued your product in some way, but, but you have a right to your intellectual property and someone else interfered with it. Notice what it says. Unintentional or intentional substantial copying of the mark. And I think that's where we got off into patent land. Okay. But back, back to trademark a little bit here. Um, you come up with an idea, it's similar to what somebody else's, you better check. Because later when somebody says, no, that was very close to our trademark, and you go, well, maybe, but I didn't know. Too bad for you. Hmm. Paraphrasing the law a little bit. Doesn't seem fair, does it? No, because if I do my due diligence. Well, I, I didn't say, I, you know, there is a difference, but that may come to damages. I would think that the burden of responsibility to say that I have infringed should have to come to the, from the person that sure. feels infringed. Sure, yeah. If, if somebody brings an action claiming that you infringed, they have the burden of showing that you did. <coughs> but I'm just saying infringement is unintentional or intentional substantial copying of the mark. So you paying careful attention to each one of those words, I'm saying that it's not a defense to say it was unintentional. So they have, to, they have to prove that you infringe, but infringe means <coughs> what it says up here, substantial copying of the mark. So you say, look, yes, my logo, emblem, motto, whatever, does look very similar to yours, but I didn't know, but I didn't mean to. The court says, well, 
so it will take into consideration my due diligence that I checked here and I checked there and I checked and I, I checked. I, I think it would in terms of um, damages or perhaps some statutory exception in, in like for example you checked and checked and checked but somebody didn't make an effort to protect something or um, there was a, an error or a problem with the system right um, but if, if it was just to whether you intentionally or unintentionally did it then no All right, so we, we, we talked about this a little bit. This is, starts on page 129. The distinctiveness of the mark. Strong marks to start with. Fanciful, whatever that means. I don't know. I can envision all sugar plum fairies. <laughs> um, arbitrary or subjective trademarks are most distinctive marks. Not only not related to a product. So, Apple, because they're not apples. Xerox, because that really wasn't a word. Starbucks, because, I mean, now you associate that with coffee, but it's not really, that word by itself doesn't necessarily make you think of coffee, Starbucks. I don't know, kind of make me think of currency with a star on it or something. Or a battle star going to yeah. uh, So that's strong. Something distinctive that easily recognized but <coughs> not real descriptive of the product itself. Yeah, you find it? Yeah, it's the, um, the American Invents Act. American Invents Act. America Invents Act. America Invents Act. 2011. Okay. Yeah, 2011, but it took effect in 2012. The AIA, and it was already amended by... Um, no, now we're going to amend it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that this year already? Or? Yes, on January 1st, 2013. <laughs> so now I come back class next time and talk about this, <laughs> and then you say, but on January 2013, it was amended to what? It was only one... Um, little minor thing that um, doesn't allow it to fall under um, post-grant challenges by USPTO. Post-grant challenges by the, by the office itself? Yes. Okay. It well, also I'll go look at this. It also falls under the Leahy, Leahy Smith American Amendments Act. I don't know what the difference That's is. That's what the AIA amended. Is that what it is? Okay. The yeah. internet. <laughs> like Patrick, but like Patrick Lay, is that what we're talking L -E -A -H -Y. about? L-E-A-H-Y. Yeah. Dash Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Senators. Okay. Well, I'll look at it. Back to your question. No, you don't need to know it, but try to come up with a good example of what that might mean. If you guys come across a, um, a case around this, okay. that's what I'm interested in. So email it to me or something. Or did I did I talk to you guys about tweeting last time? Mm -hmm. Tweeted. Um, BA two oh seven. I know one of you's already that's a hash two eight. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I get the whole hashtag anyway. What is that supposed to mean? Well if you search that hashtag you'll see. Oh, I know what it, I know how it works. I'm just saying why would you why would I don't you know why they call it a hashtag? hashtag? Hashtag BA208. You find a case out there and you're on Twitter? Or email it to me. Alright, so that's strong marks. Secondary meaning. Descriptive, geographical, or personal names do not acquire protection until the consumers associate the term with the product. Right? So one day we might have thought London fog referred to fog in London, right? But now when we say Lon London fog, we think of what? Coats. Coats. Right? What were the other examples they gave you? The old frosty treat. 
Anybody ever played that video game? Know what they're talking about? Twisted Metal. <clears throat> so on page 130, the video game series Twisted Metal depicted an ice cream truck with a clown character. This is another reason why people are scared of clowns. <laughs> right? And ice cream uh, trucks. And ice cream trucks, yes. And then apparently near the, the, the last game of the series, the truck bears the label Frosty Treats. Well, again, Frosty Treat could mean a treat that's frosty, right? But Frosty Treats became the description of... It says at the bottom there, you know, somebody came up and started using it. Frosty Treats would have to show that the public recognizes a trademark and associates it with a single source. Not me, but maybe somebody else. Because Frosty Treats failed to do so, the court entered a judgment in favor of the video game producer, which would mean what? They could still use the ice cream truck and the crazy crown clown in. I don't know. I don't know anything about Twisted Metal, the video game. It's like a bunch of cars and shoot missiles at each other. It's like a multiplayer game, basically. That's cool. <laughs> it's actually really fun. Clowns and ice cream and Pretty multiplayer. Old now, though. Yeah. What would be the equivalent today? Um, well, I mean, you could probably, like, a certain mode in Mario Kart would be uh, similar. Uh, just instead of carts. I'm sure, ice like, cream people cars. always make new iPhone games. I'm sure there's all kinds of them on iPhone and mm -hmm. Android. Somebody can Google Frosty Treats and see what. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you guys following? Strong mark, distinctive, weird name, people know right away. That's the product. Secondary, not until it's associated with that product. Otherwise, it could be descriptive of lots of things. Right? And then, uh, the next thing on page 130 and the bottom of this slide, a generic term has no protection. Right? See, the bottom it says, entire class of products such as a bicycle computer receives no protection even if they acquire secondary meaning. I'm not sure how that So happens. how did Apple get yeah. Apple? You know, because they just have so much money they can do whatever <laughs> they want. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you look at the history of that and the litigation around that name, I think, like I said, even now, I mean, it was, uh, there's been quite a few lawsuits about that very thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, it gave you some examples at the bottom. Trademarks that have acquired generic use. So at the beginning of generic terms, it talks about things like bicycle computers. Those, those never were you know, something that was only associated with one particular brand. But the ones at the bottom, it says other trademarks that have acquired generic use, they were at one time distinctive, but became generic. So. It says even duck tour. Anybody ever been on a duck tour? You know what a duck tour is? Like I went to Boston one time. There's all these boats driving around on the road. Those are duck tours. <coughs> Basically amphibious vehicles that drive around <coughs> town and then jump into the water, <coughs> people around. Uh, so if you look at the foot note there, number eight, Boston duck tours, which is actually where I was when I saw them, versus super duck tours. What do you think the, the controversy was there? We're the duck tours. You can't use that name. It's associated with us. And the court said, well, duck tours is a generic term to describe amphibious tours. Because ducks walk around the land and go in the water, I guess. All right, so know the difference between these three. Which one? Which ones have protection and which one doesn't? All right, so associ closely associated with trademarks, service marks, certification marks, and collective marks. So as it says at the top there, a service mark is similar to a trademark. It's really trademarks for services. Uh, similar to trademark, but used for services, TV, cable, radio. A certification mark, you guys may have seen, like a good housekeeping seal of approval, <coughs> UL tested. What is that? Something labs? Uh, 
laboratory. I know it's electrical. I just wonder what UL stood for. I see that on all my electrical stuff. It's an underwriter's laboratory. Oh yeah, it is. Um, so some kind of certification uh, or a collective mark indicating that it belongs to some kind of collective, collaborative, association or union. It's okay. so kind of the same thing as a trademark applied to different uh, things like services, organizations, <coughs> some testing criteria or quality. Everybody got those? And we, we mentioned trade dress a little bit already. Trade dress protects an image and appearance of a product or a store. Notice I mentioned colors could be shapes. I don't know, oyster crackers, fish shaped crackers. Animal crackers. Looking at a shape, looking at a color, you can associate that with that particular product. And then usually someone will ask about counterfeit goods, right? Because, you know, we've had a discussion about you infringing by um, mistakenly coming out with something similar. What about people who purposely infringe by coming up with something that's exactly like your product. That's bad. Oops. You probably knew that already. Um, it mentions the Stop Counterfeiting and Manufacturing Goods Act, and, and you probably will find some more recent law around this, because this, this is also an area that is rapidly changing. Used to be, you know, things like purses, shoes, stuff like that. Now, everything. There's a good chance of something you have that you, it, I mean, when I, when I say counterfeiting, maybe you think of like a Gucci watch that says Gucci on it or uh, looks a whole lot like it, but just really cheap or just, you know, but that's, not just what we're talking about. We're talking about products that have the name on it and look exactly like the real product. Um, there was, a, I don't know if it was Frontline or who, who did a special on this. I don't know if you remember the whole thing about um, how you're supporting terrorists by buying counterfeit <coughs> products. Anybody remember that? Terrorists. Um, <coughs> need to make money. In all the old-fashioned ways, the government is cutting off. So one way they can fund themselves is to produce products and then sell them and then use the profits for terrorism. So that was the whole, it was a big thing about how you, you know, if you buy counterfeit goods, you're supporting terrorism. Which in some cases they, they show in this special, but that's exactly what was happening. Cigarettes, huge counterfeit market. You know, boxes and packaging and cigarettes that look exactly like the real product. And I think in the special that I saw, I should, if anybody finds that one, let me know. I remember watching it on the internet one time. Just like, just regular goods people were finding in the store and they went in and they just looked and, and, and a lot of it was counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Mostly natural good. Um, so, there's a lot of laws around, you know, not just protecting your intellectual property rights, but trying to prevent others from duplicating your product. And then at the bottom there, trade names. Indicates all are part of a business name that is protected. For example, Safeway. And Safeway was in your book. Where, where did they see that? They also did mention Gucci watches. Um, trade names, okay. Top of page 132. The bottom of that paragraph, it says, 
For instance, the courts held that the wor word Safeway was sufficiently, sufficiently fanciful, there's that, <laughs> to obtain protection. Somebody's going to ask me today, how's your day? I'm going to say fanciful. fanciful. <laughs> That's not actually what it means. Well, what does it mean? I looked it up. Um, <laughs> it this is <laughs> great. I'm going to love this class. It, You're it like, means He's someone's the thoughts or ideas, but they're not developed. Something like that. I mean, it's still here. <laughs> like a fantasy. Uh, fanciful of a person or their thoughts and ideas over imaginative or unrealistic yeah so in in terms of this though I don't want people to get confused that we're saying we're protecting fantasies or ideas in our head uh, we're, we're talking about expressions of those unique ideas that that come out um, so unique Let's just say that for now. What, what would be the issue with Safeway? Anybody get this? I mean, there's like the discussion of whether Safeway, the word, is sufficiently fanciful. In other words, distinctive enough. If you didn't know, do, do you know what Safeway is? It's a grocery, it's a grocery store. store, right? What? What if somebody didn't know that? What would they think Safeway is? A type of travel? Uh, <laughs> Go to the Safeway. Yes. Or I want to secure my valuable goods. Do it the Safeway. I mean, you know. But, but yes, I mean, the words safe and way aren't really fancy. They, you know, I, if that helps. They're, they're not distinctive. They could describe a number of different things. Um, but then cases come along. You know, it says, for instance, the courts held and say, eh, that one, I hear your argument that that's just safe and way together and it's not real distinctive, but we're going to say public thinks, yep, that's descriptive enough of a chain of grocery stores. Works for them. Kroger, I don't know where that came from. It's a name. I think it's the last name. It's the person, the, right. the, the yeah. family's mm -hmm. company's last name. That, that I think is pretty distinctive, right? And you only think of them and other, outside the context of it being a family name, what's a Kroger? That's <laughs> what I'm saying. It is. All right. Cyber marks. Because, like I said earlier, things have significantly changed. At one time we had trademarks, uh, and, and now <coughs> those things could um, take place on the internet. Um, Kind of backing up. I still remember this. I still remember when the internet first started. I remember getting my first computer, and um, man, it was expensive, and it was this huge honking box, and it, I don't, it didn't do much of anything, but I thought it was cool. And um, people were just, the domain name system was just getting into place. And one of the issues was, like, for example, Nike or somebody who had brand recognition, now folks were going online and saying, hey, I, I want to bring traffic. I want to profit in the future from this. So they're not here. I'm here. I'm going to use their name. So why not register the .com domain Nike? Well, this... This would cause some confusion, wouldn't it? If, if you went online these days and you went to Nike.com, what would you think should show up? Something about, sh well, Probably. actually, yeah, anything, not anything well. shows up when you do that. I mean, what kind of, what kind of products does Nike, is Nike into now? Anything athletic. You want to know, you know how many steps you take. Yeah, there's even uh, there's Nike Connect. You could connect it to your Xbox 360. I mean, there's. Did you know that you have personal train a virtual personal trainer, or you're on you're on the Xbox. I'm on it. We both have a a, a live account. We can exercise together. Anybody want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> no? I don't have a Connect, so. I mean, I can't even figure out what it, hashtag is. <laughs> All right, so. Um, 
then um, I can, which, what page is that on? The page that start talking about this idea. 132 here. Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It says a nonprofit corporation. And that has actually changed since the textbook's written. There's a little more complex system for managing domain names now. And there's even many more domain names and a, and a more advanced way of keeping track of domain names now. But um, an organization first put in place to try to keep domain names straight, to prevent cyber squatting, to prevent confusion on the internet, and to handle complaints. Like, for example, Nike would have against somebody who was running Nike.com online. And eventually this moved into legislation, right? Statutes passed to prevent uh, cyber squatting. And to can't understand it, you gotta understand squatting. I mean, I think most of you understand squatting, but um, the idea of like occupying land or property or something long enough that it becomes yours, you know, if you go out on the internet and you, you, you type in about anything, somebody has the domain. Even um, those that are registrars for domain names might have it. In fact, one company got into a lot of trouble. What they would do is they, they set up a method for you to search for a domain name. And the moment you search for the domain name, they would register it and then send the results back to you and say, you can buy it for this premium price. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a cool idea? You're like, I got a great idea for a name. I'm going to put in this and see if it's available. Well, most services would say, yep, it's available. This one would say, nope, coincidentally, it just got taken. Isn't that almost like... It's illegal. Illegal, yeah. <laughs> right. But at the time, there were no cases or statutes that addressed it. I'm trying to remember who that was. I don't know if it was... I don't want to say something bad about a particular domain name registrar. What are some of the domain name registrars you guys know? Anybody GoDaddy know? GoDaddy Solutions. Isn't GoDaddy? GoDaddy. Yeah. Namecheap. So there's tons of them out there all doing kind of the same thing. Most of them are engaged in searching for hosting. Um, so not, not just in terms of registering and hosting domain names, but also services associated with those domain names, and plenty of opportunities for people just to go online, find a name, and then create confusion in the market by having a name that's similar to. So it's a little more difficult these days to create a product or create a web address that's similar or exactly the same as a product. Um, I haven't done it in the last few days, but most of them have some type of uh, disclaimer agreement about you not trying to cause confusion by doing that. So, as it says there at the bottom, cyber squatting causes confusion in the marketplace, it causes consumers to believe things that may not be entirely true. Uh, another issue that came up was um, Businesses or people who were mad at companies and say it came out with confusing web addresses that people would go to thinking it was the product where it was really a web address bashing the product. <coughs> oh, did they use an example? I think I remember an example. I'll take this off the screen while I'm coming up. Um, The one I was thinking of was Ernest and Julio. Somebody trying to get their traffic and say bad things about their product. What's Ernest and Julio? Wine. Wine. So people would go there thinking it was about wine. It was really about people, somebody saying that their product was bad. And mm. All right, so things became a little more advanced. Well, gosh, if we can't cyber squad, if we can't use the exact name or names that are similar to prevent confusion, we'll go a little bit behind the scenes. Again, I'm not the expert in all of this, but um, 
behind web pages on the internet is code. And one of the things that's often in the code is tags that are descriptive. <coughs> so when you search for something on the internet, you're not only looking at the text that's on the page, but you're looking at descriptive terms associated with the page that are kind of behind the scenes. Right, so, you know, that even like in the campaign that came out, like if you were to search for Obama or whatever, that it wouldn't necessarily return all kind results for Obama, right? Actually, if you go to his webpage and you look at the code, yeah. I think there's like a picture of Obama in code at the oh, top of like it. ASCII. Like, you know, you can do a comment yeah. in HTML or oh, okay. mm -hmm. somebody made, whoever made the website made Obama's face in the code. <laughs> Something like that. That's cute. <laughs> I wonder what the reason is. I don't, I don't know why I even Maybe, it, maybe, yeah, what were you doing? I don't know. You really into Obama. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe, um, maybe that comes up in a search result somewhere or something. Like, oh, there's this picture. Forward slash. Yeah, slash I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, keywords get embedded in pages, help with search. Yes? So when. Like, there's specific websites that are, like, dot .com, but mm -hmm. if you, like, type in the same thing, like, right. they're at, like, dot .org or dot, right. you know, gov or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, where, Might. like, why isn't there, like, infringement laws on that? Well, there could be, right? Because, um, for example, if, if I, you know, the Nike.com. Like dot my old college that I used to go to, if mm -hmm. you typed in... You know, LoneStar.com, it would bring up like a business page. But that makes if me you think type stink. in like LoneStar.org, it brings up the college right. page. Yeah. Like it's two completely different mm -hmm. entities. Right. Like yeah, GRCC yeah. is actually Greater Richmond Chamber of Commerce. Oh, really? I never mm -hmm. did that search to see. Yeah. <laughs> I know this because like, people are like, I can't find your web page. Well, if you go out there and Google it, you'll see, like, there's lots of hits for this other place. Hmm. Um, you know, in most cases, those aren't infringements. I mean, I, I think if we did Nike.com or Nike.org or Nike.biz or whatever, those, those would be. Um, I think in a lot of cases, uh, there's not a lot of confusion around that. Well, like, even with, like, um medical sites like the ADHD Association mm -hmm. or the ADD Association they that it does that there too because if you do dot org it brings up you know an unbiased reliable source and if you do dot com it brings up a very biased unreliable right. source yeah I mean I think that's a pretty common marketing strategy these days um, and those people would argue that they're not trying to confuse you confuse okay. them with the product, but they're trying to provide a different perspective or different view, or maybe even somehow provide information that they can properly. Well, I just from. thought that like maybe just because it was like at a different, you know, domain or whatever, it was not protected. Like, well, I don't think because it's at a different domain, it's not protected. Um, I think um, the real issue comes around whether it's um, Important. confusing or interfe interfering with the other person's use. And then, yes, sometimes I think if, even though it might be confusing to people that um, no one's ever challenged the issue. Yeah. Okay, with uh, most major companies, they own all the different domain names, so they'll just forward you directly to whatever their main right. site is. Yeah. Even if you put in .org. Yeah, I, I think that's true, but in some cases when you lose the race to grab that domain, that's when then that stuff happens, you know. And, you know, the Greater Richmond Chamber of Commerce is not coming after GRCC because they are confusing people about, I mean, their distinctive, unique services. I think your question, your second question goes to, well, what if they are intentionally trying to get people to think that they are the reliable right. source for information? Like, if you look, if you type in Michigan Lemon Law, wouldn't you think that you would get results about the Michigan Lemon Law? Think you would think, but most of, I mean, most, I mean, there might be one result there is actually the law, but almost all of them are attorneys 
advertising for clients yeah. mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> Some domains you can't take, like .edu's and .gov's, right. you can't take those. Unless you fall in the yeah. class that's eligible to get those. I mean, you, got, you can't be your own EDU. Yeah. But even some of that's confusing, too, because we're not just talking about traditional public institutions anymore. We've got private corporations offering open education or like uh, the one I heard about on the way in today was Minerva. I don't know if anybody knows what Minerva, for, former founder of, or president of Harvard who started this kind of open institution where you can get a quality, like Harvard education online. Right? And if somebody sees Minerva, they don't necessarily think, oh, that's a university that I could attend. Yeah. Something kind of funny happened to me. I was trying to type in what TV8, like to find a news story. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know it was like what TV8 news. I don't even know what it is yet. But I typed in what TV8, and this crazy page came up with like guys in Speedos. I won't pull it up on the screen. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. Really? Yeah. That's funny because my wife goes there every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Ask her about that. Uh, isn't that woodtv8.com? That's what I put in, I think. But or I put in woodtv8 news, I think. Yeah, Maybe that's not TV8. it. I don't know. Well, this that's an example of what you're talking right. about, right? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah you, it is, and yeah. that's why I asked because, right. like, if you go to like woodtv8, for example, like I went there two weeks ago and mm -hmm. it pulled up what she's talking about. Oh yeah. And then <laughs> like, there's I go on to at least one website every day that does that. Like, mm -hmm. at least one every as, day. As men in Speedos? <laughs> Not necessarily men in Speedos, but sometimes it's like naked women, and sometimes it's, you know, it's like weird stuff. Yeah, I'm hoping to get past this slide <laughs> for the whole time we've been talking. But yeah, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I think part of the issue is being caused by uh, this phenomena where no one types in a web address anymore. Uh, they get search. to whatever they're going to by searching it. I don't know how many people I've seen go to the, the Google field or they just type in GRCC. Yep. Why go GRC, www.grcc.edu, just put in GRCC and then click on a link to the website. Yep. So when you do that sometime or you don't know what the web address is, you end up someplace where you uh, don't want to be. If you type in, in any browser, this works, if you type in whatever the address is and then do control enter, it'll do dot com for you. Nifty hint. Control enter. In any browser? In any browser. A few well, unless you're like an Internet Explorer like 4 or something, you know, <laughs> super old. Well, that's what I'm using, so that's <laughs> If you key in the main word and then, so like, for example, if you, we'll just use Google as an example. If you type Google and then do control enter, it'll do www.google.com. It'll yes. automatically enter it for you. I bet if you put Google anything, just it's going to go to Google. Well, yeah. Google's I think they, have, they own the internet. Or something. Well, <laughs> so yeah, like Google Chrome, you just right. type something in on the top and it searches it for you. Right. right. Yeah. I think most, of, like, Safari is like that. Okay, we're getting a lot of you guys, again, know how to distract me. <laughs> um, so this is, I guess this is another example. What page is this, uh, case on? 133. 133. Can you write where to go? Okay. Um, yeah, so as a case example, 5.7, Terry Wells, a formal model who had been Playmate of the Year in Playboy magazine, established a website that used the terms Playboy and Playmate as meta tags. So again, back to what we were talking about. Not the web address, because there's that too. Remember when White House dot whatever didn't take you to the White House's website? <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember that, but um, mm -hmm. it, did, it used to take you to a really naughty mm -hmm. uh, site. Uh, but instead of doing that, this is behind the scenes putting in tags that would lead people to search for and then have this come up uh, in the results. Uh, uh, Playboy Enterprises, which publishes Playboy, filed a suit seeking to prevent Wells from using these made of tags. So in other words, these, these lawsuits aren't necessarily always about damages for what's been done, but uh, to try to prevent them or enjoin them from doing in the future. The court determined that Wells' use of 
Playboy's meta tags to direct users to her website was permissible because it did not suggest sponsorship and there was no descriptive substitutes for the terms. All right, so um, are you seeing that this is pretty gray? Mm -hmm. right? Like when it comes down to it and these cases are challenged, you know, and we're talking about things that are going on behind the scenes. Now we're starting to talk about, well, uh, a court, a judge with, with yes, they're biased, making decisions about whether something suggests sponsorship or not. I don't, it, it seems pretty direct to me, but that's what the, the court said. All right, um, and then it gives you some other examples there uh, in dilution in the online world below that. See example uh, 5.8, which is kind of a, not a very pleasant example because I was playing Candyland with my kids yesterday. <laughs> Um, so you can read that example. So again, we're back to that term, dilution, and, and companies suing and saying that a use of a domain um, causes confusion uh, in the marketplace. All right. Licensing. So far, we've talked about how you come up with an idea, it comes out of your head, you seek protection for it, uh, but it has value in other ways, too. Sometimes the most money is made by, once you come up with the idea and get protection for it, licensing it or permitting others to use it. So, also think about the idea that whenever you see someone else using somebody's product name, logo, or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean it is an infringement. One argument is, is no, it's not an infringement because I properly licensed it from you in the first place. Also think of a licensing as a way to expand globally without necessarily putting your business there. I mean, like, well, in the old days, one way to go overseas is to, to go overseas and build a plant and manufacture stuff. Now, how could we do it with intellectual property licensing? Just allow them to Just make allow them to, to, you know, they already have the production in place, and then they put your logo on it. So when you get a driver's license, are you <laughs> getting into no, the property? No. I mean, I see how you're trying to make that application, but um, a license is a right you give to someone else to do something that you have the ability to revoke. So my parents always told me that um, driving on the road was a privilege, not a right, and could be revoked for me <laughs> at any time. Kind of same idea with licenses. I can enter into an agreement with you to use my intellectual property for a period of time. And now, a license isn't always revocable in those terms. <coughs> I mean, you, have, you could have agreements as to usage Whatever. But you see this, you know, you see this in franchising, you see this in going into the global market, lots of areas where you don't necessarily produce the thing yourself, but you allow someone else to, to use it. All right, I think, um, take a look at that case, and uh, I think we're out of time. <coughs> we'll pick up here next time, next week. And I'll go. I looked at Congress's that website. They yeah. Have, there was, since it's so new, there hasn't been any national cases against it. Oh, okay. So there might be some local coming up. There's no national or local. I vaguely remember something in a podcast about it. Yeah. But, but yeah, if your dad knows of a case or scenario yeah. where that's. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think it's more. Of it it took like, place just a few weeks ago, so I doubt there's been any cases uh, involved in it because those kind of cases take years to do. Yeah, I'm, but I'm thinking more in terms of how is his practice different based on the potential that these There's a lot more work because they have to come out to do this now. They have to convert a ton of stuff over. It would take like 16 years or something. Yeah, the, their website, like, I went to the, the patenting website too. They said it takes like three years for a patent. So it's probably going to be a while before we see anything anyway. Legally, it's all going to want to automate it. I'll do a look. <laughs> Did you take uh, part one? Uh, uh,
Have a good weekend, Mr. Brown. Have a good weekend.